Hey Freight Skills, welcome back to another video on the Freight Skills channel. And in this video, I'm going to answer one of the most asked questions that I see all over Facebook groups. Uh, I get it in my group, I get it in my emails. I get it on a daily basis. It's a topic that people really want to know about. So before I tell you what it is, uh, unless you cheated and read the title already, make sure you like and subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any more of the premier information that you're gonna get on growing your freight brokerage. Now let's get right into the hot topic of today's video, which is container drayage. Right? It's one of those hidden parts of the industry. Not a lot of brokers know how to do it, but everybody wants to get into it because it is full of opportunity. Now I'm gonna explain why it's so full of opportunity, but first let's go over what you're gonna learn in this video. By the end of this video, you're going to understand where you find container freight. Where does it come from? Uh, how does it work? You know, we're gonna go a little bit into those details. You're gonna find out where do you find carriers for this container freight, right? Because not any carrier can just drive into the port, pick up a 40 foot high cube and go deliver it and bring it back. Now, if those terms don't sound familiar for you, this video is gonna help you a lot. And lastly, we're going to learn what licenses and insurance do you need as a freight broker? Do you need any? And what do your carriers need in order to be able to transport safely and legally back and forth between the ports? So now let's talk about first, uh, what is container drayage? Let's get a definition to it so that you understand it. And uh, let's talk about why it's so beneficial to get into, right? So container drayage refers to the act of bringing a container, uh, whether it be an import or an export, from the port to a customer, and that's either to be loaded and returned for an export or unloaded and returned to be discharged, right? So it works like this. When a customer orders something from overseas, what happens is a, uh, an NVOCC or a freight forwarder books the ocean portion of that move, right? So before a container comes in, it's on a boat. We know that, we see these huge steamships uh, we see them up, they're coming in with hundreds and thousands of containers. So the first portion of a container move starts out way overseas, right? A customer will order something from an overseas supplier. And now, before it gets to the port, it needs to go on the ocean, right? So that's booked by someone called a freight forwarder and VOCC. Uh, we'll cover that in another video. That's a completely different industry in a sense. The fact is, it comes over here on a boat and then it lands in the port, right? We see these container ships, they're full of hundreds of thousands of containers. There's a lot, right? That every single one of those containers is a potential drayage job for you to make a little bit of money on. Um, so if you think about it, the Long Beach port, for example, has about eight vessels at any given time that are waiting to come in with thousands of containers. That's a lot of opportunity. So the drayage market is absolutely massive. And the good thing is, any customer that has truckload work has drayage work at some point because they're getting the truckload work from the drayage that's coming in, right? Either they're producing materials and then shipping it out or they're getting materials in and then they're distributing it to major hubs, right? So that's why it's really important for you to get into drayage at some point. Uh, but that doesn't come with some difficulties because it's not as easy as just picking something up and delivering it. There are a lot of appointments that need to be made, licenses that need to be in place, and there are a lot of different aspects to the paperwork that you have to understand. All right, so that's why drayage is such an important opportunity. There are thousands and thousands of containers coming in to every single major port in the U.S. every single day, and companies need support in order to move this these containers to their final destination. All right, so now that we understand the opportunity, let's get into where do you find drayage work. Now, like I said, drayage work is present in just about every customer that ships truckloads. Now, why can we say that so confidently? The reason is because, like I said before, every truckload originated as an overseas container shipment. The only thing that changed is either the material that was used to create something that is now shipped out as a final product, or that they bought a bunch of material from overseas and now that material has to be distributed out to hubs or customers based off of purchase orders, right? So you have to understand how the supply chain works in order to see where is the container work coming from. Now, 
The cool thing about bringing containers in is that all of this stuff is public knowledge. It's not easy to find, but you can type in any product on a website that I'm going to share with you in just a minute, and it will tell you everybody who's shipping containers of that product into the United States. Uh, it's perfectly good as a lead source, and it's something that we use, and I'm going to share it with you absolutely free, and it's called Import Yeti. Um, I don't even think you need to make an account. All you need to do is go on there, type in a company or a product or whatever you want to search, and it will give you a complete list of who is shipping the containers of the stuff that you want to move. It's really useful. Uh, definitely check it out after this video. To answer the question concisely, every single customer that you have right now probably moves containers and they just don't know that you can do it too. If they don't move containers themselves, they can refer you to someone who is, right? And it's mostly, you know, the distributors, the manufacturers, they're all bringing this product in for overseas and they all need support moving their containers, especially right now. Now, part two, even if we secure this work from our customers, how do we move it? Where do we find carriers to do it? Now, this part's a little bit harder because it's not as easy to just post these loads on a DAP board. And I see it all the time in Facebook groups. People will post and say, oh, I have container work. Uh, I need a carrier that can get in with uh, UIIA. Um, that's not the only part of moving a container. So a lot of these brokers who are getting into container work are doing so without having done any of their due diligence. And that can get very dangerous as we're going to cover in future videos. So where do we find carriers that are able to access the port, know the ins and outs of container moves, and can help us move this freight? Uh, this is very easy. There's a website called loadmatch.com, also called drage.com. And what that website did, it's, it's a little old, it's a little dated. I have no affiliation with them at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't really use them anymore because we have our own database. But what that website did is it collaborated and listed every single company that's registered with the local ports. So you can look up a port and see all the companies in the area that service that port and what they provide. Um, if you pay for a subscription, they give you contact information and things like that. But I believe you can access it for free and you can see down the list. Um, you can at least see the company names and then you can go and look them up for yourself, give them a call and try to get them to cover your freight. So that's where you find carriers to move drayage once you get an opportunity. It's as easy as that. While it's easy to find the freight, it's easy to find carriers for the freight, you do have to have a little bit of a knowledge of what kind of licenses you need to move drayage freight because not everybody can just do it. Now, for the good news is as a broker, there are technically no licenses you need in order to contract a carrier to do it. Now, what you should do is you should have a SCAC code with the NMFTA. Uh, this will allow you to be inside the intermodal system. Um, it's a four letter identifier code that they assign to you. Um, basically, it helps with other certain things. There's a lot I could talk about that, but um, if you're interested in moving drayage, register for a SCAC code, it's like 70 bucks. Um, do it as a, a freight broker or 3PL and you'll be good to go. That's on the NMFTA website, which I will link down below. Again, that's a government organization. I have nothing to do with it. Now, for carriers, it's a different story. Carriers need to have a little bit more in terms of insurance and licenses. And the reason is because of the following. When a carrier goes in to pull one of these boxes out, a drayage box, that equipment is borrowed. The chassis and the container box are being borrowed from the steamship line and the port. So what happens is the carrier has to enter an agreement with both the port and the steamship line and say, look, I'm gonna pull these things out. If there are any fees assessed for being late or being out too long or whatever it is, you can bill my company, right? I'm good for it. I have the collateral to put up. Uh, you can bill me if something goes wrong. The carrier then passes that responsibility on to the broker or the company who hired them, right? But that doesn't change that the carrier has more of a liability on their shoulders than we ever will as brokers. A carrier needs a few things. Number one, they need a SCAC code. The SCAC code is from the NMFTA, and what that does is basically gives the steamship lines, the rail companies, and the ports and rail yards a way to identify them, right? It's basically like their identification number. We have MC numbers, ports use SCAC codes. That's just how it works. They also need something called a UIIA agreement. 
Now this is a series of agreements, credit lines, insurances, whatever you want to call them, between themselves, the carriers, and the places where they intend to pull out equipment. Right, so a carrier who's registered with the Port of California might not be registered with the Port of Houston. Right? These things aren't interchangeable. There's not uh, reciprocity. So an example, if you get a firearms license in Florida, uh, you might not be able to use that firearms license in New Jersey. It's the same deal. If you have a UIIA agreement with the California ports, you might not be able to go to Chicago. You might not be able to go to Texas or New Jersey. That's just how it works. So for a carrier to pull out containers, they need to have that in place. Now, on the driver level, there's another certification that they need to access the ports, and that is called a TWIC card. It's a Transportation Worker Identification Credential. I actually have one of those myself, and what this does is it gives you access to private areas of government properties, like the ports and the rail yards. You can actually get one for yourself too. It just requires a background check, an interview, and fingerprints. Uh, as long as you have a clean criminal background or you have explanations for your expungements, you can get a TWIC card. But in order for the drivers to access the ports, they need to have this TWIC card too. So this is a question that you usually have to ask your carriers. If they're going into the port, you have to say, do you have a TWIC card? Can you access the port? And as far as licenses, that's really all a carrier needs, right? They need those three things. SCAT code, the UIIA agreement and insurance, and the TWIC card. Now, all ports have different rules. There might be other approved carrier lists that uh, vary from port to port, and that's because some ports are privately owned. In New Jersey, for example, uh, there's a terminal called Mar Terminals. It's privately owned. Uh, it's, you know, technically has to do a lot with the government, but the ownership is private, so they can make their own rules. There's another one in New Jersey called GCT Terminals, which is in Bayonne, New Jersey, and this is notoriously stricter than MAR Terminals, right? So there are different rules that cover different ports, and a lot of carriers will pick and choose the ones that they want to go into. This is the most basic level that I can get with drayage. I'm going to do a few more videos on how to break into the market, uh, what are some things that you need to look for with container drayage, because a lot can go wrong, and uh, what are the most popular niches for container drayage. Uh, but if you don't want to wait for those videos and you want my help directly with getting drayage freight and understanding drayage moves, uh, I offer a complete drayage module in my course um, it, a lot of people are calling it the Netflix for freight brokers. It is right linked down in the description below and there's a full write up when you visit that page. It'll tell you everything, uh, what's in the program, what kind of support you get from me, and of course, uh, what your investment would be. So definitely check that out if you are interested in breaking into the drayage market. That course is the only way that I can really get into the intricacies of drayage and give you a full, you know, step-by-step -step breakdown of what it is. And now, I didn't want to let you go empty-handed, so I did include a bonus in this video. If you want a little bit of a taste of what's in my course, uh, you could head down below and I will give you a complete checklist of everything that you need to complete a drayage move. So if you're moving drayage right now or you're thinking about getting into it, it'll give you a bit of a clearer idea of the things that you need to have in place and what to look for when you're actually executing these moves. So you can get that down below, just head to the link Enter your email address and I will send that over to you personally. Now I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, this is a really hot topic. I get questions about drayage every day um, and I see a lot of false information going around in other broker groups. Um, as far as I know, I'm one of the only brokers teachers that are uh, teaching drayage uh, just because it's, it's not really a niche that a lot of brokers get involved in just because of not knowing what's out there. So I hope this was helpful for you. I hope you took something from this and if you did, please don't be shy and hit that like button. Make sure you follow my channel so you get updated every single time that I post one of these videos. And remember, I'm posting a lot more drayage content because it's so highly demanded. I don't want you to miss the next installment. Make sure you're following, turn those notifications on so you get alerted the next time a video comes out. And now, until the next video, I'll talk to you soon.